Hello and welcome to Scott Rock, our brand new podcast by Climb Scotland, bringing you climbing stories and mountain tales from Scottish underdogs and local heroes. Your hosts are the legendary, well, me, Callum McBain, and me, Robert McKenzie. Callum, what is the plan, bud? Well, we both love interview podcasts, and for our jobs, we get to travel around and speak to loads of different climbers. So we thought we would combine both of these things and share the stories we hear through this podcast. That's right. We're not just interviewing the hardcore among you, but literally anyone that we think has a cool story to tell. And we know that there's a lot of you out there. So keep an eye out every fortnight for the latest Climber Chat. And if you have anyone you'd like to hear from, or if you want to be in the show yourself, let us know and spread the Scott Rock word. And remember, guys, when you get back out there climbing, back to the crags, back to the walls, be safe and do your buddy checks. Enjoy the podcast. Hello and welcome back. You are here with Robert and this is Scott Rock. Uh, This is episode seven and this week we have a true Scottish hero. This is a special one. Uh, But before we crack on, I want to ask... What do you think so far? Have you been enjoying our little project? Let us know. Leave a comment, send us a message, hit us up at Climb Scotland, let us know what you think. If there's anyone that you would like us to chat to, or if you want to be on the show yourself, I'm sure we can make that happen. But yeah, any feedback at all, send us a message, let us know. Any feedback is good feedback. But anyway, let's get back to it. Like I said at the start, this is a special one. Uh, Back in February, when we started interviewing people, I drove up to Glenroy and sat down and had a cup of tea with the legend that is Mr. McTai. I didn't really know what to expect going into this interview, but I was blown away by the life that this guy's had. Uh, I hope that I do this interview justice. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. But yeah, again, let us know. Send us some feedback. Now, we were sitting in his caravan in the garden and about halfway through we got hit with a big hailstorm. So it does get a little bit noisy, but it's only two minutes the the storm lasts for. It's not as frying bacon in the background. Don't worry about it. Um, But yeah, it'll pass. So stick with it. And just before we kick off, Mick actually has a request. As you're about to find out, Mick is known for... A lot of things but he also runs the Scottish Mountain Heritage Collection which is a collection of historic climbing equipment that is absolutely incredible to see but in his collection he has hundreds of ice screws and pegs and random bits of metal work that are all duplicates that he doesn't really have a use for anymore um, so he wants to know if there's anybody out there who is arty minded any students, any artists, any sculptors who would be keen to use some of this kit for a sculpture or an art project of some kind. I think it'd be really cool to see. So if you are anyone or you know of anyone who fancies a little lockdown project with some interesting bits of kit, give Mick a shout at the Scottish Mountain Heritage Collection on the website. That's uh, smhc.co.uk, smhc.co.uk. Uh, Give him a shout, take some kit off him, make something really cool. That would be awesome. But yeah, let's crack on. Without any further rumblings from me, I bring you Mr. McTai. So yeah, we we shall just kick off. So we are sitting here in McTai's caravan, speaking to the big man himself. Uh, McTai, old school mountaineer, as old school as they come in my my regard. Um... Big history, trusty of the Scottish Mountain Heritage Collection, uh, dedicated 30 years of kit. Is it 30 years? How big's your collection? How long have you had that for? Oh, it was a personal collection originally, uh, i.e. McTie's personal collection of mountaineering junk. And then, <laughs> I mean, that started uh, 30, 40 years ago. Right. And then it's become a charity now yeah. and uh, people give us stuff, so... That happened 10, 15 years ago. So 30, 40 years of junk collecting and uh, 10 or 15 years of, uh, should we say, professional junk collecting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, I mean, that, that's not what you've been doing either. You ex-Royal Marine? 
Yeah, I was a farmer's boy initially, yeah. and then I joined the Royal Marines when I was a teenager, uh, 10 years in the Marines. Yeah. And after I left the Marines, I was briefly a mercenary, uh, which might be another story. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll uh, definitely get into that. <laughs> and uh, then I became a professional mountain guide, which I've done for the rest of my life. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, British and international mountain guide. Yep. Rather impressive. Founder of Nevis Guides as well. Yeah, Nevis yeah. Guides was my little business that yeah. I started back in 1982 uh, and we continued successfully for 40 odd years until I retired just a couple of years ago. Yeah, And old school mountain rescue member too. 30 years in Loch Harbour Mountain Rescue Team and I think about 10 as the national training officer for all the rescue teams in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say that was a very uh, busy but a very pleasurable time. Yeah. So, proper old school mountaineer. Uh, Not sure about the old school mountaineer, <laughs> but uh, we'll see anyway, carry on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, through all of that, I reckon your history and your experience in this is pretty unparalleled. At, you know, the, the things you've done and the knowledge that you've got and what you're passing on, or have passed on, you know, it's it's pretty unmatched. There's there's very few people out there that could match you in that, in my regard anyway. Um, and you are a fellow Mountain Culture Award winner at the uh, Fort William Mountain Festival, aren't you? you yeah, that, the uh, Fort William Mountain Festival started, oh, I don't know how long ago, 10, 15 years ago as well. Yeah. And they came up with this idea, a guy called Lex Tillotson, who I think, I think it was Tillotson, Lex anyway, was an Australian guy and he actually set up the Fort William Mountain Festival along with several other people. Yeah. And he came up with this idea that we should have a cultural ambassador. And lots of people kind of laughed when they thought Mick Ty, cultural <laughs> ambassador, doesn't work too well, but never mind. And uh, I have to say, I, I feel very privileged to have got the award and to be amongst uh, people, every one of them who I know personally. Sadly, a couple of them died. People like Andy Nisbet last yeah. year who was a personal friend, but Hamish McInnes, who was a personal friend, Richard Elts, uh, another. Uh, lady uh, got she was doing a talk the other night uh, the Myrtle, Myrtle Simpson. Simpson and she's a beautiful lady so anyway all those people are all cultural ambassadors and we've got a new one this year called Colin Pryor indeed great the big man yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean that award like you said there's a lot of people that are true legends that have had that award but I think you definitely deserve your name up on that board as well well I always thought I was a little bit down the list there but never mind uh, fine <laughs> carry on yeah <laughs> Um, so, I want to start off, would you classify yourself as a climber or a mountaineer? Uh, definitely a mountaineer. Yeah. Uh, I've been a climber all my life. I have to say, uh, uh, one of the highest things on my list of dislikes is being called a trad climber. <laughs> Uh, I, I am a climber. The trad thing annoys me intensely, but never mind. Uh, I've been a rock climber. I've been a mountaineer. I skied for Britain when I was young, so yeah. I think I can oh, wow. cover lots of spectrums. Uh, so a mountaineer, very much so, yes. I've never yeah. been a hard climber. I've never been a hard ice climber, but I like to say perhaps I would like to be rather than a trad climber. I'd like to be an adventure mountaineer. How about that? that, that I like that. I like yeah, that. Yeah. I don't even remember, but when we met here last month, uh, the first question you asked us were, you guys aren't boulderers, are you? You aren't these boulderers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, right. no, no, I, I, I like trad climbing. And the look you gave me, daggers. Yes. Daggers. Well, I mean, just because I don't like it, if you're going to call me a trad climber, fine, it just annoys me, but I don't mind. I don't lose sleep over it, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's what I meant by the, the old school mountaineer. Uh, it is just climbing. Well, having said that, uh, I'm not, I, I can be a rather boring old git, but uh, I'm not anti boulders, I'm not anti climbing walls. I think they're fantastic. I just see, I don't use them much myself, but I yeah. just see a climbing wall in my opinion is just another form of gymnastics and if it leads to people climbing fine and if it doesn't great but uh, I mean to me I'd rather kids old and young spend time in a climbing wall rather than shooting up drugs and doing all the other horrible things so I think it's a great thing yeah you know? no absolutely well said. <coughs> well said um cool so I want to dive into it ex-royal marine mm -hmm. how long were you in the marines for I was in, in the Marines for 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. 10 years. And in that time, you were uh, the Arctic and Mountain Warfare trainee? Trainer? 
Yeah, most Marines, well not most Marines, all Marines go through basically what is glorified infantry training. Right. Uh, shooting rifles and running around there. And then they have this commando. So all Marines are all commandos, the green berries yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So then we have to do this commando, but all Marines do that. Uh, and they do this commando course, which is running through bogs and swinging around on ropes and doing 30-mile route marches and stuff like that, which is basically an add-on to your infantry training. So then if you pass all that, you get a green berry. But after that, you can specialise in being a platoon weapons instructor. You could become a chef if you wanted. <laughs> uh, and various other things, signalers, this kind of stuff, lorry drivers. Yeah. But I specialised in... Uh, what used to be called cliff assault okay. techniques. In the old days, commandos used to go in on landing crafts and climb up cliffs, as in the guns of Navarone and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but our job was to go up first and fix the ropes. Okay. Those things don't happen anymore because we have things called helicopters. So <laughs> we then, which is a very interesting period in my life, historically, when we were part of the Cold War. And for the younger right, generation yeah. who are listening, this is when we thought Russia was going to invade Europe. And the only uh, common border between Europe and Russia was in the north of Norway. And the Russians also had their submarines up there. Yeah. So we're not going to uh, digress into a total history lesson here. But if the Russians had attacked uh, Europe in the 1970s, then they would have tried to secure the northern part of Norway. So, we think, right, we'll send the Marines up there, they'll they'll stop them, you know, so we spend four or five hundred Marines to train in northern Norway to stop four or five million Russians to come over with a few thousand tanks. It would never have worked, of course, <laughs> but... Uh, so, they wanted people, and our climbing cliff assault wing diversified into a mountain and arctic warfare wing right so we were trained to ski we were trained to live in snow holes we were trained to fight in the snow we were trained to, and we were trained to teach people to do that yeah. by the norwegian army by various other people so we became the instructors to teach the marines right yeah so you were based up in norway being trained by the norwegians they yeah, i was uh, and several of us were but they would not allow the norwegians would not allow permanent bases of any forces in the world to be other than themselves to be based on Norwegian soil right, so okay. we would go for four months every winter base ourselves in Norwegian barracks and uh, train uh, for these alleged Russian hordes yeah. and uh, we would then come home in the spring after yeah. we'd done our winter warfare training yeah and occasionally we'd be joined by the whole world and his dog i.e. the other NATO forces NATO being national NATO Northern Atlantic yeah, Treaty yeah. Organization uh, and we would be uh, we'd have Italian French American troops would all converge on the north of Norway assuming that the Russians were going to come and get us <laughs> fortunately they never did yeah but now we've got Mr. Putin they might come again you never know yeah. <laughs> you've had to go back out yeah <laughs> um so during all any of that were you actually deployed in it no uh not we weren't deployed for anything serious uh, I had been uh between, I was based in Singapore for a year and then between that I went to Northern Ireland uh, when the Troubles were on in Northern Ireland, another little bit of history of the Northern Irish Troubles and during which time I got shot, that was a bit painful. You got but, shot? Well, it was only in the bottom. I got, shot in the, <laughs> I got shot at the top of my leg and all my mates reckon I got shot in the backside because I was running away. But I wasn't really. It was a ricochet. So that was another story anyway. So uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry for laughing at that, but if anywhere no, you're going to get well, shot, it's going to get that shot. Was a whole, that was a whole fun of it. Yeah, getting shot in, in, in the backside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was another story. You know, there were so many stories rattled around that and obviously things with the IRA and stuff like that. Yeah. And then when I was in Northern Norway... I was, uh, I was, one of my jobs was to train uh, a unit called SBS, which is a special boat, boat service. service yeah. yeah, I wasn't actually in the SBS, and for those people who are listening, most of them have heard of the SAS, which is a special air service. Yeah. The SBS is part of the Marines, which is their underwater division, and they kind of sneak in on submarines and stuff like that. So my job was to train them in how to survive in Norway once they come off their submarines. So they had to ski, they had to live in snow holes, they had to fire their weapons in the cold. So I was attached to them for uh, a couple of seasons, well, three or four seasons in northern Norway. I was their trainer. Right. Uh, but they, unfortunately, uh, to get their revenge on me, 
took me away on a couple of uh, kind of should we say secret missions uh, in their submarines, which scared the hell out of me. I have to say, uh, and <laughs> no they were underwater. <laughs> they were secret at the time, but uh, they weren't. They were no, we weren't fighting anybody. But interestingly, we won't go into too much detail. But uh, there's a mountain. There's a, a an island off the north of Norway called Svalbard. And at that time, it was contested between the Norwegians and the Russians. Right. And uh, the Russians, for instance, there's a coal mine there. And the Russians had barracks for about three or four or five hundred men. Right. Uh, they were for the coal miners. Uh, but there weren't any coal miners there. No. Uh, so why would you have barracks in the air when, yeah. when your Russian submarines are... A little bit suspect about, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other interesting story, which you'll have to do a talk with the, a submariner sometime, uh, that the, the fun and games that was going on between the British, the Russian, the American submarines up there was something else. Oh, actually. yeah? Oh, yeah, something else. So like playing games with each other up there? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just cat and mouse practice hunt and search. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the British submariners had a, a, a code name because they weren't allowed to speak about these things. And a Russian submarine was called a black iceberg. Uh, lots of things like But you need to interview a submariner about that. I'll see if I can hunt one out. Yes. I'll see yeah. if I can hunt one out. Um, so you, you eventually left the Marines. You said you were a mercenary. When I left the Marines, because I'd worked with the uh, Special Boat Service, uh... A couple of the commanding officers of the special boat service, when they retired, they set up a security company. Right. And another little bit of history, and it goes on now, but there are, uh, should we say, security jobs all over the world. Yeah. Uh, and most people have an idea of a mercenary who runs around in Africa shooting people and getting chopped up with cookeries and things like that and Gurkha and so on. Yeah, but it doesn't happen like that. Uh, well, it does occasionally. Sounds like but, the West End uh, of Glasgow. Sorry? Sounds like the West End of Glasgow. West End of Glasgow on a Saturday <laughs> night, yeah, so kind of thing, yeah. But a lot of the uh, security jobs are incredibly boring things like bodyguards. Mm. Uh, for instance, there are a large, there's a large Arab community okay. that come to London in the summer. Yeah. It's like people going to their summer house, you know. Uh, they come to London and live in London and they have very posh houses in Chelsea and they employ a bodyguard. Right. And uh, bodyguards in the UK are not allowed to carry weapons. So basically the bodyguard is a childminder. Yeah. So, But you get paid lots of money to do it. <laughs> very well paid. Yeah, yeah. And what happens if, if your Arab person that you are guarding uh, gets shot at, you are meant to stand in the way and get shot yourself, but nobody would ever do that. You basically run the upper protection smartish. Yeah. <laughs> Is that uh, why you got shot the bomb? Make, yeah, yeah, that's why I got <laughs> shot the bomb, yeah. Anyway, my job was uh, the, a bit, I, I think it's quite interesting this, because the Basque people of Spain got themselves a semi-autonomous government. Yep. A very, very, very similar to Scotland, mm -hmm. yes. And we better not get on to Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Hammond at the moment in this let's, interview. Let's That's try another not to get political here. Political here. <laughs> but it was slightly worse than what we have in Scotland, is that the Basque government were piggy in the middle. The uh, Basque people themselves were kind of pleased that they got a semi-autonomous government, uh, but they weren't 100% happy that they didn't get full independence. Right. The right-wing Spanish fascists didn't like them getting any independence at all. So the Basque government were disliked in several quarters. So they needed a bodyguard. Right, right. My SBS bosses, who had then set up a private security company when they left the Marines like me, had the job of training their bodyguard. Okay. So I was hired to go out and help train the Basque government's bodyguard. And they were being trained in, uh, the bodyguards have to get trained in shooting weapons, which was not my speciality. Driving cars, they call it escape and evasion driving, which yeah. is not my speciality. But they do a thing called SWAT, yeah. which is special weapons anti-terrorist. So if somebody gets captured and you have to do them, and many people, the elder people remember a thing in the Iranian embassy in London where people abseil down and die through windows in black jackets and, yeah. and throw grenades in the windows. That was my speciality. One, because I knew about ropes and climbing. I knew a little bit about weapons. So my job was to train the Basque government's bodyguard in special weapons anti-terrorist, and I did that for two summers. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how did you move from that then to becoming a mountain guide? Well, the jobs, uh, the the uh, mercenary job uh, then could have escalated, and what happened in the mercenary business is you get paid large amounts of money for doing not a lot. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the money goes up dramatically as the danger goes up. Yeah. So when I finished with the Basque job, uh, I'd still been climbing in the, I was only doing that for about six months a year, so I'd still been climbing because I was a climbing instructor in the Marines. I'd been climbing the skiing in between. They then offered me uh, a three-fold increase in pay to go to a place called Angola nice. in, uh, in Africa. Yeah. And this was a place where people were getting chopped up with machetes and machine guns. Yeah, and, scary killed place, and, Angola. and you knew instantly when the price went up three times, and you're talking about the equivalent of about a thousand pounds a day yeah. now, wow. you would get offered to work out there. So you knew if you were getting that money, the chance of you getting a chop was 100%. So I decided this was not my life, <laughs> and I became a mountain guide. Wow. I feel like that was probably a good call. I would say it's yeah. the best call I ever had. Yeah. And I've been headhunted several times since, because I'm a bit of a stroppy git, as you can probably imagine. And I've been headhunted, I got very recently, and I'm now nearly 70, I got headhunted for a job in Iraq to try and keep a company called Black Hawk, who is an American security company, men under control who are busy running around shooting people willy-nilly and they said we want somebody to uh, keep these guys under control can you do it and i said no in very large capitals yeah no that doesn't sound fun it doesn't sound that fun. doesn't fun and the chances eh? of you uh, surviving that are about nil Pretty and low. the pay rate was unbelievable i bet you mm. oh, chances of you actually getting that paycheck at the end of it yeah. pretty slim yes yeah, yeah. Uh, so what did the process like look like from coming in from that to becoming a mountain guide? Did you have to start from the beginning of all the qualifications and build your no, way up? No, because uh, get... I was technically a mountain, a military mountain guide before yeah. I left the Marines. So we we worked, we climbed, uh, pretty much all over the world. I mean, I worked in Norway a lot, but we used to go back climbing in the summer. I did things like the Troll Wall in Norway, second or third ascent. Oh. Uh, which is a mile high wow. piece of rock for those people who don't know it. Yeah, that's a big I climbed all, a lot of the big north faces in the Alps because that was part of our job. And it yeah. was even better if you're a marine instructor because you get paid to do it. Because <laughs> we used to go to Norway in the summer and then we would go climbing in the, in the Alps in the, in the... Sorry, we go to Norway in the winter and we go climbing in the Alps in the summer. Yeah. And we go climbing in Cornwall to train our new recruits. I got jobs in America, Canada, all over the place. Yeah. So the transition, albeit there was a bit of mercenary work in between, I was still climbing, I was still skiing. And at that time, when I was in the Marines, I'd actually skied for Britain in the biathlon team, the skiing and shooting. Yeah. Uh, briefly, so I could ski as well, which is part of being a mountain guide. So I was pretty well qualified to become a mountain guide already. Right, yeah. right. I just had to change from the military version to the civil version. Yeah. yeah, yeah, How did you have time to do the ski world championships? The, the... Well, we didn't. I I actually trained with the British biathlon team. Right. When I was, I think, about twenty three or twenty four, and. I was beating a lot of young lads who were in the biathlon team by a few minutes. Right. On a, in those days, we used to race 20 kilometres uh, by just a couple of minutes. And my trainer, uh, or the trainer, said to me, well, you're doing okay now, mate, but you're old. You're 24, <laughs> maybe 24 nearly 25, yeah. Because they were training young lads then yeah. uh, to do the Olympics in the next four years and maybe the next four years after yeah, the next four years after that. Yeah. So if you're 25 in four or eight years time, you're history. Yeah. Whereas these guys are in their teens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the same happens throughout the running athletic world all over the place. Yeah. So they basically said, you might be going okay now, but these guys are going to be faster than you. And they were. Yeah. You yeah. know. So basically I got punted out of there, which was fine. Yeah. And, and I, I skied in various ski mountaineering competitions after that all over the world, but I, uh, I was not in the biathlon. I never actually represented... Britain at the Olympics, although I did represent Britain a couple of times, and Scotland, strangely, with a with a English accent. But when I represented Scotland, I had to get intravenous Scots pies every morning to, so I could be legitimate. Yeah. Nice. And have nice. a haggis for tea. I bet you that did wonders for your blood pressure. Yes. Um, so how, how did you end up settling in Scotland then? That was easy because... Uh, my last six years in the Marines, we were based over a place called the Condor, which is just outside our broth on yeah, the East yeah. Coast. And 
when we were based in the Condor, we used to go from there to Norway in the winter. We come back to the to our broth, which was our base. Yeah. Uh, and then we go out to the Alps, so we come climbing on the Ben. We go to Glencoe. We climb in Glen Clover. So I was basically for the last six years in the Marines. I was Scotland based. Yeah. And when I left the Marines, one of my best friends was living here in Roybridge, where we are now, and I basically came and stayed with him. Nice. Uh, and rest his history. So I've been I've been in Scotland since I was. Uh, maybe 20, 21 or 22. Wow, right. But I never okay. lost my English accent, <laughs> albeit my father was Irish. So there, there's a nice mixture for you. <laughs> yeah. um, so you set up Nevis Guides. Yep. Is it still running? No, uh, Nevis, yeah, I work briefly. There's a thing called the Joint Services Mountain Training Centre that trains military personnel. Yeah. And they had a civilian instructor, by which time I was a civvy, uh, after I'd done the uh, the mercenary jobs. So I worked there for three or four years as an instructor for the army, basically. I was what's called a, an instructional officer. I was a civil servant, but I yeah. was a climbing instructor. And then in 1982, I set up Nevis Guys, and I'm now 69, I think I am. I uh, wound up Nevis Guides in 1965. Right. And I still uh, do pretty much what I used to do before, but I don't get paid for it anymore. That's <laughs> all my mates say, can we go climbing? And I get a free meal and a few drams, so that's the only difference. Ah, that's, yeah. yeah. that's all you need. That's all you need. I've got a young wife who's working, so she can keep me. That's fine. <laughs> Kept man. Yes. I like it. Yeah. I like it. I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? Yeah, a dream, yeah. 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 Um, so you set up Nevis Guides you were still doing big Alps and Rockies trips around then were you not? well Nevis Guides was was a uh, uh, what do you call it an eclectic I think that's a good word isn't it eclectic and, yeah, yeah I'd look it up on the internet uh, <laughs> eclectic mix I had a, another ex-marine working for me and a couple of other people and we basically did winter mountaineering here in Scotland during the winter we yeah. went and climbed sea stacks and did new routes on the island of Lewis all with my clients so once mm. again I was dead lucky I actually got paid to do what I wanted to do but I had some fabulous clients. Many of them have become personal friends over the years. Yeah. And in the in the summer, we went to the Alps. Uh, and I did that for 30-odd years. But after about 10 years, I got incredibly, uh, I won't say annoyed, but did not like alpine huts. And anybody right. who's yeah. listening to this who's been in an alpine hut and it's full of people from all over the world, all smelly and farting and carrying on like that, of which I was doing as well, I thought I wanted some real mountaineers, so I started going to the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. And uh, we went to the Rocky Mountains every second second summer. Right. And uh, we then started doing uh, big ski trips in the Arctic. Uh, an Arctic Norway, not in the Antarctica or, or Arctic North, but right in the north of Norway. We used to go out every winter for two weeks or three weeks unsupported. Basically, we'd uh, uh, take our sledges and pull all our food with us. And we'd use, uh, once again, if anybody's listening to this, an unbelievably fantastic hut system that is run particularly by the Norwegians and the Swedes. Okay. And a little bit by the Finns, because uh, the top of Norway, if you like, is uh, pretty much uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia are all pretty much all of one up there. Yeah. And uh, the hut system in Norway is absolutely fantastic. And unbelievably as well, most Norwegians, although everybody think this, do not go to the mountains in the winter. Yeah. So you have this wonderful it. hut system, which is chock-a-block in the summer, and in the winter, they're empty. Yeah. And you can join the Norwegian or Swedish Tourist Federation. You get a key to the hut. In the southern part of Norway, some of the huts are actually stocked up with food. Ooh, nice. Uh, which you just sign a little chit and put your credit card number and post it and say you've had this amount of food. In the north, there's no food, so we yeah. had to take it with us. But we did that for many, many winters, and it was just unbelievably yeah. fantastic. So it's true mountaineering. You, you're skiing, you're navigating, you've got blizzards, yeah. you've got avalanches, you've got food, you've got all kind of just fantastic. Proper adventure style. Yeah, yeah. yeah proper expedition style. So all these trips were part of Nevis Guides? Yes. yes. Ah, yeah. right, okay. I, 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 was, I, I thought the Nevis Guides was your way of kind of funding these big trips. No, Nevis Guides was a mountain guiding company, which was my company. Right. And I had another guy called Bill Newton who was uh, self-employed, but he worked with me. And if I needed a couple of extra guiding, so Nevis Guides was Mick Ty's mountain guiding company. Yeah. And all yeah. my adventures. And that's why I would say it's a bit eclectic because my clients tended to come looking for an adventure. Yeah. Uh, and which, yeah. that was a bit dodgy sometimes because it meant you were kind of close to death several times, but we survived. <laughs> yeah. well, that's the whole part of adventure, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, out of all that, like, so you did a lot of Alps trips, Rockies trips, yep. Norway trips. Yep. 
Have you got any standouts? Standouts? Yeah. Well, I, d I don't have any particular standout, but the first thing that came to my mind when you said that is the question I get asked probably most. Uh, one, Well, the two questions I get asked, have I been to the Himalayas? Is no. Yeah. I've been just about every other mountain range in the world, <laughs> but not the Himalayas. And I never avoid it, just so I've got other places. Yeah. Uh, but the other question I get asked most is, what's my favourite place? Which is kind of almost what you're asking. Yeah. And there is no question, it's exceedingly easy. The North West Highlands and Islands of Scotland in the springtime. There is no finer place. You're a patriotic man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I 100% I agree with that. 100% agree with that. Um, like, the Rockies, the Rockies are a special place. Well, they are a special place, but they're, they're not, in some ways, they're not very pleasant. There's a joke, uh, well, it's not a joke, it's probably true. They, uh, this guy said, if you find, when you're climbing in the Rockies, if you find a good hold, put it in your pocket and save it for later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so have you, did you do any work trips that, I don't know, really stood out? Like, is there any, any of your Alps trips that were, like, a bit scary? Like you said, you were close to death a couple of times. Oh, no, they're all scary. They're, they're all scary. scary. Oh, yeah, they're all scary, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 well, there's nothing that comes to my mind. Yeah. And what does come to my mind is that I would be very hard to find you the opposite question is which was your worst day? Because I would say 99.9% .9 of the days I've had in the mountains have been brilliant. Yeah. And that includes the bad ones, uh, which have, you know, there's, there's something special. And once again, people who listen to this, who know about the hills, know that there's nothing nicer than being out in the Northwest Highlands in the springtime on a perfect sunny day. But somehow, if you're out on the bend or something in a blizzard and a storm, when you get back down and you've kind of challenged the mountain, there's almost the same feeling, if not better. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like when so you even feel... the bad days are good. How does that sound for a quote? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Even the bad days are good. Yeah. I like that. That could be the caption of this whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, like if you go out and it's... Grim weather, horrible conditions, you're doing something that's a bit grotty and minging, potentially yeah. a bit loose, proper yeah. adventure style. You feel like you've earned it. Yes. Yeah, that is a special thing. Yeah, I should say, uh, I, I'm just thinking as we were talking, uh, if you ask me what is my favourite thing, not necessarily my best day, is new routes. Yeah. I've had a lifetime very fortunate in climbing new routes. Yeah. When I was a young Marine, uh, my boss said to me, you are going to take three or four of the other guys out on a uh, staff training trip. You've got two weeks. Anything you want, I'll get for you. I want you to come up with a good idea. Yeah. So we decided we were going to go to St Kilda. Nice. Yeah. We had a Land Rover and everything like that. And then somebody told us there were no roads on St Kilda. That's nope. how much I knew about it. So I thought there's no <laughs> point in taking the Land Rover. The National Trust for Scotland, who owned it at the time, said you can't climb there anyway. So yeah. we didn't go. And I thought, well, I've still got two weeks. I've got a Land Rover. I've got all the resources. I've got all the ration packs. I've got all the food. Where's the next closest place to St Kilda that's a long way away? The west coast of the island of Lewis. Nice. Yeah. And we went to the island of Lewis in 1974, and we found about 20 miles of unclimbed sea cliffs. It, there's just there's still an incredible amount to do. That. Well, I've been going there nearly every year since then, so that's nearly yeah. 40 years or 40 years plus. And we've done, I personally have done about, uh, I don't know, I have no idea, several hundred if not thousand yeah. new routes, yeah. Uh, an interesting thing too, at that time, once again, I know a lot of young people listen to this kind of stuff, some of the old people around me, there was a plan by a guy called Graham Tyso, most people will know of Tyso's shop, well Graham Tyso yeah. was the guy who set it up, he's dead now. But he had a plan, and he wrote about it extensively, saying anywhere north of the Highland Line, i.e. Fort William up to Inverness, north and west of there, nobody will record new routes. And that will then be forevermore a wilderness where you could go and do a climb and not know if anybody had been there before. It wasn't yeah. recorded, it wasn't in a guidebook, and it would become the wilderness. This was back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, got into that idea. I thought it was great. Yeah. And we climbed for... 74 was the first time, maybe 10, 15 years... And we did hundreds of new routes and never recorded one of them. And then lots of people came along and said, "Who have you done that route? Have you done that? And some of my clients said, well, I wouldn't mind my name. In, I want to be famous. Can you not put my name as I've done that route? So I then tried to go back through my notes and things and see if I could retrospect it. But 
there were hundreds of the routes that we've done that people have subsequently done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not hard routes because we weren't climbing hard. Uh, and I couldn't go back and say, well, we did that and we did that. We did that. And I couldn't remember anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, but now and then I think, well, I did that route. You didn't do that. But that's my fault, not their fault. They didn't know. It's I'd not do, about yeah. the. It's, yeah. it's not about the fame. It's about the no. blame, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But then I did start recording, and man, I do record them now. So, yeah. uh, but that's the way the world's gone. Yeah. But it's an interesting concept that that should be the last great wilderness, but it never happened. No. And I have no. to say, one of the main reasons that it it, it didn't happen, vanity. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody wants, Everybody wants their name in a book. Exactly. Everybody wants yeah, their name in a book. Yeah, and I, I can't argue that I'm not one of them. As no, well. I, no, like, I'm the same. Like, yeah. I've got my name in a book a couple of yeah. times, and I'm very, yeah. I'm proud of the stuff that I've got in there. Yeah. But yeah, I love the idea of going out and climbing something just because it looks good, not because someone's done it before and told you that it's excellent. Yeah. You know, I, I love the idea of that. There's definitely, you know, if we were to stick to that, there's definitely a few classic lines that might go unclimbed a lot. Mm. Uh, which people could miss out on. So I, I, I do appreciate the fact that there are routes recorded, but if it looks good, go and climb it. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of that, regardless of whether people have done it before or not. Mm. Um, so yeah, I actually really like that idea. Mm. Um, but like you said, it, it's vanity and everyone likes their name in a book. Um, and I actually, I tried, I, I picked up a couple of the guidebooks that I've got in the house and I tried counting how many routes you've got your name to. Uh there was more than I expected, but there's obviously a lot more that you've never actually put down, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. How many routes do you reckon you've actually... Oh, well over a thousand. A thousand first ascents. Yes. Whew. Yeah. But that, that goes from, uh, you know, some grotty V-diff to some horrible hard VS. So I've never climbed anything more... Uh, once again, not everybody listening knows about the grade. I've never climbed more than E3, yeah. unless somebody's holding me very tight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but well, that's another very interesting thing, which is a slight bugbear of mine, is that the media, the mounting, climbing media, has got everybody hyped in to thinking if you don't climb E4, E5 or E very hard, you're not much use. The vast yeah. majority of climbers climb, and if you listen to this, if you're one of them, climb around severe hard VS uh, at the most E1. Yeah. And what's very interesting is... That a lot of the routes we did, obviously we picked the plumb lines, and we were only climbing about those grades back in the 70s, 80s and 90s. The vast majority of those climbs have been classics. And I see people all the time who say, Christ, Mick, we did one of your routes out in Mingley, we did one of your routes in Lewis, we did one of those in Caithness, in Orkney. Bloody fantastic. Well, that's, that's nice to think that's an accolade for me, but it's not really. What it's really saying is that we climb at those kind of grades and a lot of people do them. Yeah. Very few people go along to Dave McLeod and say to him, that was a wonderful E11 you did because <laughs> nobody can bloody climb it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and uh, we did a route, uh, for instance, in, in Mingley called uh, Archdeacon. Yeah, I have done that very route. You have done that yeah. very route, yeah. And we named it after my mother-in-law who was actually a deacon in the church and the arch went over, there's an arch we were climbing over and I think it's one of the best routes in the world. Yeah. But it's hard VS and E1. There are brilliant loads of other routes, but because it's that amenable route, everybody that goes there does it because it's in their grade, yeah. which proves that most people climb at that grade. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. It's the same like for, for in climbing walls, everybody climbs at 6B. Yes. Like the majority of people climb at 6B. Everybody outdoors climbs around the same grade, like yeah. hard, severe, yeah, hard, yeah, severe. Yeah. Yeah. Like in my opinion, the best grade out there is VS. Yes, but I have it is. never climbed a bad VS. No, very, ever. Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all spectacular yeah, yeah. because they're, they're relatively easy climbing. You can be a bit more relaxed, but the gear's good, so you're yeah, not yeah. scared yeah. out your nut. Yeah. Um, and to ram the point home, we discovered another one, well, yet another new crag in. Uh, well, a friend of mine called Kenny Schooler in, in, found this crag in Lewis, a place called Braga, right? Ardmore Braga, and he found it. Um, but then we did, it's the most wonderful piece of Louisian nice rock, but nearly every route is severe BS or hard BS, and there's about 20 of them, and they're all star routes. Yeah. And the whole world and his dog goes and climbs there, and that proves that that's what people climb at. Yeah. People climb elsewhere in Lewis, and people do climb E6s, E7s, E8s, of course they do, but the percentage is minuscule. Yeah. And it's slightly annoying when you buy a climbing magazine, and everybody on the front cover is hanging off a, you know, maybe boring old farts like me in my blinking tweed jacket don't look very smart on the yeah, front cover yeah. but it gives this impression that if you can't do that you're not a climber which is nonsense yeah you know yeah. go and do that vdf go and do that vs go and do that severe yeah it don't matter you know i think it is it is improving slightly um i i see you know I, like you i've seen pictures of magazines and it's all who can climb the hardest 
who's done the hardest grades, who's done the scariest, boldest stuff lately. Um, but it is definitely changing. There are more just who's going out and doing fun stuff, who's going out and having cool experiences. And that doesn't mean that you need to climb hard to have a cool experience. Yeah. Uh, so I think like in the media, it is changing a little bit. It'll take time to get to, to get there, obviously. And there, there's still going to be big stories about who's done the hardest, raddest stuff. There is, but the bottom line, when we're trying to come work out another quote, is you, you don't have to be hard to enjoy your climbing. Yeah, you know, that's absolutely. It, you know, the, one, of the, one of the hardest climbs, or the most tricky climb, I remember it was about 40 years ago, is a thing called Wisdom Buttress, yeah. which is in the Fisher Field Forest in the middle of nowhere. And technically it's V-Diff, I think. And uh, it was the most scary climb. I think I've got two runners in 1,000 feet, and I've never been so frightened in my oh, life. God. So I'll go and have an adventure on a V-diff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got asked this question the other day, actually, and I've got no answer to it, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably guessing you're the same. Out of all of those, do you have a favourite? Favourite what? Favourite route. A favourite route? Yeah. Uh Probably not, but instantly you said that there's a route, one route in Lewis, and I can think of a thousand if I start thinking on called uh, called Moak Wall, and uh, and that one we just mentioned the Archdeacon. Yeah. Uh, because to me, I said to you that the Northwest Highlands and Islands in the springtime are the finest. Yeah. And the sea cliffs of those highlands and islands are even finer. Yeah. And if you can get out on a nice day on a sea cliff, on a V-diff, or a Severe, or an E9, whatever you climb at, and get the atmosphere of the wind, the, the, the waves, the uh, everything like that. Uh, but one of the first routes we did on our 1974 trip in the Marines to Norway, we had a bit of old gear. Once again, the young people might not remember, it's called a Moak. It's like a little wedgy thing. And we didn't have friends and all that kind of stuff and we had about six of these moaks and if you could get them into a crack uh, fine and i think i've got about six or seven in this climb i think it's hard vs now or e1 yeah and it was just wonderful and i could think of maybe another dozen like that but that's one that springs to mind anyway yeah yeah i uh, see i was the same like as soon as i got asked the question i i thought of a route and then was like oh no that can't be my favorite i've done this i've done this i can't pick out because they're all amazing yes you know yeah. you get on a a, a diff on a sea cliff somewhere on the west coast of Scotland, there's nothing better in this world. Yeah, there really isn't. That's a do a tricky question too. Some people may know a television, uh, sorry, a radio program called Desert Island Discs, yeah. and I remember hearing uh, a lady on there who was the, I don't know who she was, an opera singer, or something, and she played uh, all her own songs, and she got slagged off for being a rather pompous lady for paying her a fine. But why can't all her own songs be her favourite. Mm. So should my favourite climbs be the ones I've done the first ascents of, or should they be somebody else's? No. You know. But to me, the memory of the first ascent of that climb, I don't care what people think about it. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah I, no. Absolutely. Really, yeah. Absolutely. And interestingly, talking about the waves and the sea, uh, as a guide, you you uh, nowadays as a guide, you really have to speak a foreign language. Like most of our guys live in France and they can speak French. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky that I learned to speak Norwegian when I was uh, in the Marines so yeah. I, I was a Norwegian translator and I know some Gaelic but it's interesting you talk about I was talking about the wind and the waves the Norwegian sorry the Norwegian the Gaelic speakers have something like 30 or 40 words for the waves yeah. because they spent a lot of their lives at sea so the waves can be rough they can be calm they can quiet and this that and the other and we actually named some of our climbs in Mingley using those Gallic words, ah, like nice. a, a word called kusron or kusona means the mournful sound of waves. So we named a climb that, you know, because nice. that's what it sounded like when yeah. we were climbing, you know, so they think, yeah. Ah, nice. Yeah. I'm, well, I'll hopefully I'm going to get back out to the islands uh, this year, so I might uh, look up some of The your call stuff. of the isles, yeah. Might, yeah. Um, so coming back to uh, being around Loch Aber then, your, mountain re your time in the mountain rescue, um, you did, you said fur? years was it? 30. 30. 3-0. Well I think it was 28 or 29 yeah right. in Lock Harbour Mountain Rescue Team yeah. From when? 1978-79 until 2000 or something. Right okay uh, and you did, also did a lot of training for the mount, other mountain rescue teams as well? I was a training officer for all the rescue teams all in Scotland them. for about 12 years. 12 years yeah. wow. As so, well as being in Lock Harbour Mountain Rescue Team. Over that time then, obviously, Mountain Rescue was a massively evolving beast through all that. New kit coming in, more people going out in the hills, uh, 
probably more call outs that come along with that. Hail's getting heavy now. Getting hail on the caravan window here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know what this is going to do to my sound quality. Um, so how involved were you with the with this evolution? Very. Very. Yeah, I, uh, I like to think I made a few differences. I'm totally aware there were a lot of things I'd love to have done and I didn't succeed in. Right. Uh, and I was also, I had no powers as a training officer, I could only have powers of encouragement. Yeah. Uh, but a lots of things happened on my watch which either I instigated or other people instigated. And one of the biggest things, which has nothing to do with me, uh, was actually a guy called Davy Gunn. Some people might have heard of Davy Gunn. He was in the Glencoe rescue team. And he was one of the first guys, not the first, but one of the, to really get into medicine right. and first aid in the mountains. And amazingly, up until that time in the 1980s, the, the first aid in the mountains was pretty basic. Yeah. And we used to take the mickey out of Davy because he had a he used to uh, try and revive people on the on the hill if they had a heart attack. Now, can you imagine if we didn't do that? Now we used to laugh at him because he did do it. Yeah. Now you get into trouble if you didn't do it. Yeah, you know? you've got to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I don't know whether Davy was uh, responsible for it directly, but one, amazingly, one of the biggest leaps forward in mountain first aid was actually carrying oxygen to the people. Right. Because in my area, when we started, we didn't carry oxygen. Yeah. And now, if you said that a rescue team didn't take oxygen to any casualty, because yeah. it's the best thing you can give, there's no contrasign, there's no problem, it's very natural, you can't make a mistake, just give them oxygen, you know? Yeah. Apparently, some silly reason if you can't give somebody who's got weed killer poison or something, or there's, some, there's one contrasign, I think, but anyway. Yeah. And that was an amazing revelation. Amazing revelation. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, like, Kit, the advancements in kit have definitely helped with that. You know, well, the, that's, oxygen that's bottles a, back at the start. Well, um, oxygen bottles first of all weighed about half a hundred weight. Yeah, now yeah. we've got lightweight aluminium bottles and stuff like that. And the other thing that we, uh, sorry for anybody listening to the interview, we're getting a full <laughs> blast uh, hailstorm on the windows here. So hopefully that's not doing finally too much Scottish winter has yeah, arrived. Yeah, that's eh? right. Yeah. Uh, we're actually sitting in our caravan up in Glenroy where we're getting a good blast of it at the yeah. moment. So that's fine. Yeah, the clothing was, uh, I did some studies on this, very very unscientific studies, but it's not difficult really. If you look back in the, before the Second World War and certainly after in the 50s and 60s where the clothing was very poor, yeah. you would see instances of mountain re rescues, accidents, not as many now as we have now because there were less people on the hill, but there was a very high incidence of hypothermia and frostbite. Right. Very rarely that happens now, yeah. because the kits get better. Yeah, uh, we now have more actions like with people with falls, and instantly, interestingly, right across the whole board, from time mountaineering began until now, and I suspect forevermore. I'm going to ask you now. You're interviewing me. Here we go. What is the biggest single cause of mountain accidents in Britain today? Ooh. Always has been, and always will be. Pause while we listen to the yeah. uh, hailstones. Hailstones, my cogs turning in my head. Whew. See, I'd like to say it's you know something simple of people going over their ankles or uh, and being unable to walk or anything, but in, in my head, is it inappropriate kit? Navigation. Navigation. Navigation, navigation, navigation. Nearly all mountaineering incidents or instigated by poor navigation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, people actually in the statistics they tell you it slips and falls. That's yeah. what it says, right? But a lot of people slip and fall because they've made a bad navigation. They're around. in the wrong place. So when we find yeah, because they're in the wrong place. We had dozens and dozens of rescues in Five Finger Gully on Ben Nevis. Yeah. They slipped and were injured, they slipped and they died, but they would not have been in Five Finger Gully if they hadn't have made a navigation error. Yeah. 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 And a navigation error does not have to be a horror show like death and broken legs and all this kind of, it means you come down the wrong side of the mountain and your car's not there yeah. and you can't get a taxi and you miss the pub, you know, <laughs> it could be really serious like that, you know, yeah. and you could be late and of course if you're a family man and, you, and you, you, your wife or your husband's got the tea on and the kids are waiting and dad's not back, why is he not back? Because he made a navigation error. So there's an incredible amount of misery and angst and of course ultimately death and, and the vast majority of it comes down to navigation yeah. and of yeah. course 
iPhones and view ranges and this that has not helped. No. No. No, it hasn't. Because what have you gained on one side, you've lost with batteries going flat, people relying totally on their, their navigation things, you know, the apps and this, that and the other, you know. Mary had a little lamb. She also had an app. Eh? <laughs> now she's in the cemetery that. because she couldn't read a map. Love it. Love it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like the, the you know, the the growth of people using apps and stuff like that has just made more people not knowing how to actually use a map. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um and like how many people do you see heading out or how many people do you think are heading out that don't have an uh, an app on their phone or a map with them? Well, we've got a lot of people now who don't they can't actually read a map. Yeah. They actually go on a, on on their phone, and they you know, and then some people put you know uh, in the GPS and put waymarks and things in. Yeah. And it's a classic example that one. If you're putting planning a route the day before and you put your waymarks in, and you don't have a map to show you what what's round about, and then of course we know you can get maps on your phone as well now. But uh, then. If they've put about 20 or 30 waymarks in, and by the time to get the 25th one, they're guaranteed to make a mistake. Yeah. And then, of course, if they, if the, they don't know when they're putting a waymark in, sitting at home the night, the night before, whether that's going to be an avalanche slope. Yeah. Or whether yeah. the wind's going to blow from the left-hand side and blow them to the right-hand side. So they might want to drop down to the right to get out of the wind. They might go around to the left to avoid an avalanche slope. The waymarks don't fit into that plan. No. You know, so the, the, they have to have this basic plan. And, of course, we're all living in a world where we think, uh, electronics can solve all our problems. It can't. can't. You know? can't and it runs out of batteries. And it's not a boring old guy like me who's saying you must go back to basic. But that's what you must do. Yeah. You should not go on to a hill. Yeah. You know. It's interesting too that very few people would think about learning to ski without hiring a ski instructor. Thousands of people go to the hill uh, without doing some basic training. Yeah. They just because that's it. Fine. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. If you want to wander around in the hills on your own, fine. But if you want to die, tough. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I think a lot of people, a lot of people go out there and don't really respect how actually dangerous it is. Yeah, you know, they, I mean, we had one on the bend just two weeks ago where people wandered down almost totally in the opposite direction from the summit of the bend and had yeah. to be rescued into yeah. a place called Corrie Ewan, which some people may know. That's they now are down as slips, falls, hypothermic. The, all the things in the mountain rescue team show that's what happened to him, but yeah. in fact they made a navigation error. Yeah, that's the result. But the cause was navigation yeah, error. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's a shout out to everyone listening to this. Learn how to read a map. Yes. Um, cool. So we've got a little bit of time left. The reason I met you in the first place uh, is coming up here to have a look at your collection. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've got a question for you, actually. Do you play any instruments? No. No? No. Nope. Wish I could. I'd love to play an instrument. Yeah. I'd love to play an accordion. Particularly accordion, I think, and possibly violin, but I can't. I, it's, I, I accidentally ended up playing, I, I say accidentally ended up playing in a gig in one of the bars in town, I, and Ian Sykes and all that was, was around the table. There was about 20 guys around, and I didn't know if you were one of them or not. No. Um, so, well, that's cleared that one up. Well, I can try and sing, and if I have the right amount of whiskey, I can sing a little bit. I think that's, that's definitely... That's my Irish, my Irish ancestry, I think. Again, that could be that X-rated podcast that's right. <laughs> I was asking about. Yeah. Um, so your collection here, uh, the Scottish Mountain Heritage Collection. Yep. Um, you are a trustee of it. You've donated all your, your collection. Um, what made you start collecting? Because pr- previously it was a, it was just a personal collection, wasn't it? Yeah, basically my... Uh, my I told you my father and my mother was English, but... All my ancestors are Irish, and basically they were Irish tinkers. Yeah. And Irish tinkers steal things. And, well, they don't steal them, they borrow them. <laughs> so I borrowed a few things, and people gave me a few ice axes, and somebody gave me a pair of crampons and an old rucksack, which is my, as a mountain guide, that's what mountain guide. And if I was in the Alps somewhere, I got something, I got an yeah. old member, got an old Alpine lantern or something like that. And then uh, the Nevis Partnership, which is kind of an organisation that runs the Glen Nevis, Ben Nevis area, were trying to get money for a footpath, heritage lottery money, they couldn't get it. Yeah. So to cut a long story short, they said, can we use your collection, Mick, uh, to boost up our, our uh, application for heritage lottery money for the footpath? Right. Uh, so they did. And they said, right, you can get, I think we got about £40,000 or something, but the deal was I had to give my collection 
to the new trust and make it into a charity. So the right. Scottish Mountain Heritage Collection is now a charity. Yeah. So basically I had to write a letter to myself, because I'm the chairman, <laughs> saying, Dear Mr Ty, uh, we now hand over our gear to you, signed Mr Ty. Uh, <laughs> so all my collection then became a charity, which stayed behind for the nation. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, we use that heritage lottery money to set up a website, which you can have a look at if you want. Absolutely. Uh, and we had to take photographs and archive it, and we've got a shed just near where we're sitting right now, which is full of the best collection of skis in Britain, and we used that money, and now it's gone. So uh, we basically do everything for nothing now. Yeah. 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 But if you have any old junk, uh, our golden rule is if it's a family heirloom, stays in the family. Uh, if it's going to go in a skip, we don't like that, give it to us. Yeah. 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 And all the kit you collect is still in the barn next to us. It's right behind yeah. us as we're speaking. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we're gonna go have a look at that in a second. So I mean, that's that's why you donated. How much is in there? How much have you collected? We have, without question, the best collection of mountain memorabilia in Britain. Yeah. We have, without question, the best selection of skis because we had uh, quite a lot of our own, but then the Scottish Ski Club donated their skis because yeah. they wanted a museum and they couldn't find one. Uh, once again, on the other side of where we're speaking now, there's a, a, a replica railway carriage which has maybe over 100 pairs of skis in it. Wow. Uh, and there are at least another 100 that aren't in there. They're yeah. stashed somewhere else. And on the other side of where we're speaking now... Uh, the most of it's boxed and archived and labelled and stored. We have, I think we have nearly 2,000 items. Wow. And there are organisations like the Alpine Club. The Scottish Mountaineering Club has a good paper archive, but not a lot of artefacts. In fact, a lot of the Scottish Mountaineering Club members who pass away, yeah. we get their artefacts and right. they keep their photographs and books and stuff. And we work in connection with them. The Scottish Mountaineering Club actually even speak to me even though I am English, <laughs> uh, which is amazing. Uh, took a long time, but we got there yeah, eventually. Yeah. Uh, and I think things like the uh, Royal Geographical Society, they have a lot of stuff, probably yeah. a lot older than us. They go back a wee bit yeah. more. Uh, but, you know, we're all inclusion. And there is a, a mountain heritage collection down in the Lake District, Yeah, uh, an English version of us, and we work together. Yeah. 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 So how far back does your collection go? Uh, we just got an ice axe there somebody gave us the other day, which is called a Bend, a B-H-E-N-D, -E which is handmade, and I think it's the only company, well, it's not a company, it's just two guys, that still make homemade ice axes in Grindelwald in Switzerland. But the one we got given, I think, goes back to around 1880 or 1890. Wow. And it's exceedingly rare. Yeah. Uh, and we have a pair of skis in there, which go back to about the same era. Wow. Uh, we have an oxygen set from Everest, which is on display at the Mountain Festival in Fort William as we speak. Saw, I saw that last yeah. night. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, uh, look, we go back that far. And then yeah. coming forward, uh, maybe 10, 15 percent is 19, 20, 30s. The vast majority of the gear we have is uh, kind of, I would say, just between the two world wars. And then by far the biggest amount is from 50s, 60s and 70s. Yeah. 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 Including my favourite of all, uh, social history to write. Anybody reading to this who's doing a university degree is a fantastic job. Handmade stuff. Yeah. And homemade stuff. Before we had tysos and nevis sports and brigham's and all that people made their own and we have ice axes made in the glasgow shipyards yeah. we have jackets sewn at home by men and women not just ladies uh the homemade stuff is a wonderful story yeah. fantastic stuff yeah. yeah yeah i was yeah i was gonna ask have you got any favorite bits of kit uh i want to say a particular well the homemade stuff in general because yeah. the history with it you know, I, uh, some old guy gave me a, a, an axe that he'd made himself in the shipyards, and he's passed away now, but he gave me a little A4 sheet of how he made it and how he did this and how he made the shaft and wow. uh, this. Uh, and, you know, an ice axe looks simple, but the shaft has to be of a certain wood yeah. and the head has to be a certain strength and all kinds of things, you know. A lot of engineering. Uh, a lot, and he gave me a little A4 sheet that was, was you know, fantastic. So yeah. the homemade stuff in general, uh, definitely, yeah. I yeah. mean, I found a... I found an old ice axe in handmade ice axe when I was doing a rescue in Five Finger Gully one time. Wow. How the hell did that get there? <laughs> we didn't find a body attached to it, yeah. so I don't know. How long has it been in there for? Exactly. Wow. You know, yeah. 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 Um, and like, obviously, I've had a little bit of a look through your, your collection. The, that oxygen tank you've got, that, that was actually on the 
the hill of yeah, the expedition. Yeah, we have a, an oxygen tank from the 1953 Everest expedition, and it belonged to a guy called Mike Westmacott, who right. is now deceased. But he was on that expedition. He didn't get to the top, uh, and that oxygen tank didn't get to the top, but it was used up to the South Coal. Right. And uh, we have a picture with the tank uh, in the Mountain Festival right now, and there's a picture of Ed Hillary going yeah. for the summit. We're in the exact same, not the one, but the you know the, the, I think there was about six of them yeah. on that expedition. So we wow. have one of the six. Yeah, that's a fantastic bit of kit to have. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and you've got a pair of really nice shiny Hamish McInnes pterodactyls in there as well, haven't you? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. The ones you've seen uh are were made by a friend of mine oh and they're made out of stainless steel ah. hamish didn't make them that'll be wh uh, why they're nice and shiny yeah they're uh, hamish mckinnis uh pterodactyl replicas right exact replicas because the guy that made him was an exact guy and he made them way back in the 1980s not long after the pterodactyls appeared and yeah. he made him he just set to and made him out of a piece of uh, some pieces of stainless steel yeah and gave them to my wife and i as a wedding present Ah, oh, nice. Yes. Nice. Nice. So you you got a fantastic collection here. And like Mick said, if there's anyone who would like to see the collection, they can get in contact with you over the website. The yeah, the, the, we, have a, we try and have an open couple of weeks every year. Yeah. Uh, but generally the collection is not, it's not a museum open to the public, unfortunately, although we'd like to do it. Uh, to have it open to the public, we need more buildings than my barns around about here, but we yeah. do try and have a little display. Not generally open to the public, but if people get in touch with me and I'm here uh, and you bring cream cakes, then you're very welcome to come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Bring, but bring the cream, cream cakes, cakes must be real cream and not uh, <laughs> not synthetic. Yeah, I made that mistake. He's sitting there with a half-eaten synthetic cream cake there. The cream's not good enough. It'll do. It'll, it'll do. do. It'll do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for sitting down with me. We have bashed out an hour there. Okay, lad. Um, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll put this together and I'll let you know when it, when it comes out. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Wow. Just wow. What a chat. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much to Mick for sitting down with me. Uh, remember, if you have any arty friends or if you are arty and want a little project, give them a shout. smhc.co.uk uh, I really look forward to seeing the finished product from whatever someone creates. I think that'll be really, really cool. Uh, I would normally say do your buddy checks, but stay safe, stay inside, do your thing. Hopefully we can get back to the walls, back to the crags as soon as we possibly can. And I hope to all see you there soon. See you next time on Scott Rock.